here and are willing to listen. So as Mike already mentioned, we are going to talk about Tango. Um, but first, I would like to introduce to you what, what I'm doing. So I work with breeders. Uh, within the breeding cycle, for instance, the input is usually it's gene bank material or generated mutations. Uh, trade fixation is more within the, in the breeding company using all kind of tools they have available. Then you, they introduce the trait into their breeding material. I come into the picture again uh, when parental lines are generated, like double haploid technologies, and then these DHs go into parental line testing is the output, and then goes into large seed production, uh, where the female and the males are planted, uh, crossed, and so on. So, and I'm actually active in all of these fields. Um, the main problem is, uh, Again, here for the breeder, not having enough crosses to select from. Um, together with a partner lab, we help, for instance, to do embryo rescues to provide material uh, to go further. And again, here on double haploid generation. Uh, as was mentioned by Mike and Jan, seed production is all about costs, so it should be cost efficiency efficient as possible. And also here, it's um, the underlying factor is not enough seeds and rising seed productions. Underlying factors are genetics, growing conditions, and pollen management. So I have two parts in my talk, which is why crosses fail on the pollen side, and the other one is on the ovule part. So on the pollen, um, well, most of them, you know, you know, uh, if you're a regular visitor of the Amphor Academy, that pollen uh, develops in very distinct steps, which are genetically controlled. And using um, the Amphor uh, technology, you can clearly uh, follow the development of the, the pollen grain once released here from the tetrate. You, they increase in size because the vacuole increases, they start to divide, and as they mature, they uh, accumulate sugar, that's why the water is less, and they increase in size, and then they're ready to germinate. Uh, what you also have is, in some genotypic backgrounds, is that you have unreduced gamage, which gives you uh, diploid pollen, and when you use that for crosses, you end up with triploid species or Oops. Um, you have other problems, like it generates male sterility because of the unbalanced chromosomes. You have a compromised pollen germination, fertilization, and a poor embryo development. Uh, or even, especially when you have um, yeah, odd chromosome numbers, the embryo will not germinate or will not progress into a plant. If they do, some products might be sterile. And you can all select against this. I simply by measuring the pollen. Um, plant growing conditions, well, we heard all about climate change, and this has been published, so we know that high temperatures kill pollen, um, and moderate heat inactivates pollen germination, and that goes in a gradual way, so if you increase the temperature step by step, your pollen germination goes down. You can follow it by uh, using just the measurements, uh, what actually happens is that the pollen tube gets shorter. So it will not, might reach the first uh, um, excels, but it will not grow any further into the style. Uh, another factor that I found uh, recently is that actually light quantity affects pollen or microspore um, quality. So these are four different genotypes, and each of them reacts differently to the light sum, to the amount of, of light they experience uh, in the season. So one seems to be completely ignorant uh, on the light, so there is some genetic problem, but others increase their pollen viability depending on the light intensity they get. This is important to know, in, for instance, if you go for double haploid production. Um, and also, if you want to develop maybe also heat resistance. I don't know. Usually, when you have heat, you have also high light intensity. 
or not? Is it? Well, genetically, um, plants have um, photoreceptors, and there's a lot in the genetic background. And by selecting for these uh, receptors, you probably be able to predict something more over here. I've been experimenting a lot with double haploids as well. What I see is that also the light quality matters. So here you have three genotypes on the normal growing conditions, and it's the number of pollen um, that varies depending on the light you use. So this is Valoya light, which is a bit reddish, and this NS1 is most um, closest to the sunlight and has a bit of UV. And this green line prefers NS1, while the others, it doesn't matter really. So also the light quality can have an influence. Uh, additional factors, well, we just saw this cucumber experiment by um, Alexandra. So what goes along with the decrease uh, or increase in age is the decreasing uh, pollen viability and germination. In cucumber, it's nicer to see, and also in some orchids. So this is some work from years ago. Uh, you can cannot read a phalaenopsis orchid over 15 days. It uh, looks pretty happy, and it only uh, decreases a little bit in pollen viability. But if you have the Cumbria species, they're actually almost dead. Um, five days after opening. So if you want to make orchid crosses in certain species, use them as young as possible, or you just measure. Um, coming back to my pesticide story, my <laughs> question from this morning. Um, I had a, a setting trial uh, years ago when I was developing this technology, um, and I wanted to correlate the seed set with the pollen viability. What happened is... Um, at the beginning, we had a viability of 30%. This is a tomato microtome. We got some polymerian trips, and my colleagues sprayed with a cocktail of uh, certain pesticides um, against those two. A week later, um, uh, the pollen viability dropped down to 5%, and it took two weeks to regain. So if you remember the talks before having a pollination period of... 30 days, you have seven days of unfavorable conditions, which also means that you have some pests sometimes. And you spray, plus two weeks, you're done. And then, of course, there's short-term pollen storage, which should be most of the time always in the fridge and never at room temperature. There are some breeders um, that take their frozen epis and just put them behind your ear. That's not a good idea. Um, having measured pollen for almost 10 years, um, I also know a bit of the pollen storage processing, so you explained it already, uh, and I was allowed to use the um, images from, from, from Todd. Um, I sometimes get samples where you have actually the same genotype, but different pollen lots. And um, this is strange. So what happens? Um, and I was tempted, actually, knowing this pollen storage, and also know a bit how uh, pollen harvesters or processors handle pollen, because in most languages, pollen is regarded as dust, as dead, and they treat it like that. And they dry it sometimes like laundry, which is a bit scary. So <laughs> I was setting an experiment uh, using just the face data from the machine. It's just a single analysis data uh, and simulated the treatment using sample one, which is here in the picture there. So I treated my dry pollen for 20 minutes at 35 and 40 degrees, rehydrated and measured. And they are pretty much unaffected compared to the original. If I rehydrate, so let them gain some water and then treat them for 40, uh, at 30 degrees for a couple of uh, minutes, I'm able to reproduce what has happened to sample two. So you can 
be used as pollen diagnostics or uh, improve uh, yeah, storage protocol? What's, how often can you um, thaw or re rehydrate and so on? So it's an easy experiment. So in conclusion, whoops, yeah. So probably it had regained some, some, uh, some water just by just chucking new, newly harvested pollen to an old sample, put them back into the, the dryer again, and then you get this, this mess. So the pollen uh, summary is, well, you can screen, you know that all mutants, best pollen donors, heterans, growing conditions, pollen-friendly pesticides. Uh, you can optimize the crosses, picking the right flower, storage, DH protocol, which is a different story, and you can detect detect bad handling of pollen. So what helped my customers actually by using this, it helped them to increase the success rate from in crosses from 20 to 80 percent, increase seed yield, and that helps me to develop double haploid protocols and optimize them. So but if what if if you cannot explain your problems in seed production by the pollen measurements. This question came up um, by working with the seed producer and his customer. Uh, I had analyzed um, all the process at the seed producers with regards to his pollen management. It was all fine. So that couldn't be, but I had only a few lines and never the whole set of the production. So what we did is that first we checked all males which was 13 for the pollen viability and germination, which is okay. Okay, this one is a little bit low, but maybe that was a single measurement point. What we also did is that we checked the pollen viability during the pollination se uh, season. And they're all good, nothing to, to complain. And then, okay, we were sitting together. What about the ovules? So why? What's going on? Um, well, if you compare pollen and an ovule development, it goes in parallel. The, sometimes the, the ovule development is ahead of the pollen or the other way around. The difference between is in the cell division. Um, here, all four cells go into uh, develop into pollen, and in the embryo sac is just one that starts to divide and forms actually the embryo sac, which is um, fertilized. Uh, other than pollen, uh, ovules are packed. They are surrounded by tissue quite often. They are not always loose, uh, like this. And well, after fertilization, you get seed development. So for me to consider um, going into ovule measurements, uh, are the differences. If you look here at the Arabidopsis flower, you have here your pollen, and these are the, the ovules. So there is a size difference. So in my case, it was 20 microns for, for the pollen, and the ovules had about 150 to, to, to 200 micrometers. So these guys can easily be shaken, harvested, as you all know it, but these guys, you really have to isolate them manually. What Marcel probably likes is because you need much more buffer. <laughs> um, and you can uh, not use um, the mature ovules, at least in my case, because they're just too big. Um, I have to use a filter of 300 micrometers, and I need the 400 micrometer um, G, G ship. Um, difference of pollen is, well, you can collect the pollen at the end after the measurement, and it's still fine for doing germination assays or even maybe for pollination. That's not the possible with, with ovules because you have disconnected them from their feeding tissue and they're dead unless you want to use in vitro fertilization. can be done. So um, before we go into it, I have to be very careful not to lose a lot of my ovules. So I have to calibrate myself <laughs> uh, using... Uh, yeah, having a, a, de a constant amount of viability and also the number of buds I, I isolate. So I yeah, tested myself, calibrate myself, 
that my method one gives me the highest viability and the highest number of viable obvious um, per, per but. And what has to be considered as well is that like, like pollen, also ovules increase in size as they develop. So I had to use um, relatively young flowers, maybe two days before antesis, compared to old ones, to be able to get it through a filter and through a ship. Okay, well, that tells already a bit that there's a likelihood that it works. So these are the pollen that um, belong to the, to the same species. This is a classical thing you know. And if you look at the ovules, it's actually the same. It's just a scale difference. Um, so, yeah, no problem. Uh, what you then can do is, uh, because I, I, I like my temperature experiments, um, so here you have the pollen from the species, and it drops about fif at 50 degrees in its viability. But the ovules, when I isolate them and treat them uh, with heat, they are more sensitive than the pollen, actually. So with all these heat experiments, maybe it's not only the pollen that goes down the drain, but also the ovule viability. When it comes to the experiment and the problems um, that the sea producer was facing, um, we had 11 mother lines. Oops. Um, I tagged three plants each in this field. I had a s they had all the same planting diet, uh, greenhouse conditions, and I took all uh, flowers at the same development stage. So what you see that uh, I had three groups. Um, where one had just below 200 uh, viable ovules uh, per, per flower, uh, a group with just a bit higher, and then a group which had certainly different, so up to 1,000 viable ovules per, um, per flower bud. If you compare that to the data I got from the seed producers, um, and they calculate in gram seeds per plant, there is a relatively good correlation between these measurements and their prediction, except for the, these two mother lines. So the double dot means it's the same mother line, but with a different pollen donor, which giving a different hybrid. So I don't know, this might be the combining ability that is not matching, or there's something else going on. Uh, coming to the uh, observed decrease in in, uh, in production, so this is hey that should be there. This is the same slide as before, and but on the right hand side, um, I've also checked what happens to the ovules during the pollination period, and what you see is that especially the high productive lines with a high number of ovules are going down at the end of the pollination period. So. There are many underlying factors for that. So one could be that it's just a, a sink source relation. So there's a feedback of the plant from earlier set um, flowers to the new ones. Okay, I have already set. Please don't produce so not so much anymore. Um, or it's a little bit of heat because that's in, in springtime when this production takes place. And also in the Netherlands, it, it's getting hotter. Um, but there are also genetic things that, that can happen. So for the obvious summary, well, I think like on the, on the pollen part, you can actually just by this simple experiment screen for heat tolerant uh, pollen acceptors, find the best ones um, with high ovule numbers. Um, the isolation methods, if you want to apply it to other species, you have to calibrate yourself again to, to get um, a good isolation and uh, relate it, if possible, to the seed set. The limitation at the moment that I'm experiencing is the obvious size versus the chip, because I cannot go higher or, for instance, um, use ovules 
just after pollination and send them through the chip because the obvious increase in size as they are f uh, pollinated. But at least it helped to pinpoint um, a problem in seed production. So for them, it would mean that, for instance, give bringing new plants after five weeks of pollination period and then start again with these new plants. But that's a logistic thing for seed production and maybe even more expensive. So future questions, okay, what's growing condition effect on ovule per ovule ratio and different genotypes? As I said, the sink source um, question, spacing problems is also mentioned in the literature, or it's flower position or simply aging of the plant. Uh, I don't know about the pesticides on ovules, but I have a genogenesis um, protocol for double haploid production, and it happened to me that there were aphids in, in the greenhouse and the people had to spray uh, and add a systemic um, middle um, um, substance. And my DH production dropped down to zero within a week. So there's probably also something going on. What I cannot tell you at the moment is what is actually measured when I send the ovules uh, through the machine. So that would need maybe some mutants on, on ovule development or whatsoever to, to give an answer to that.